you, Cindy, for the introduction and for the invitation to speak to you. Um, I'm going to talk about using AI in the classroom, but a much simpler um, and I think less broad use of AI than ChatGPT. Um, and I'm going to discuss how I've been implementing and using AlphaFold 2 to predict protein structure in a bacteriophage genome annotation class. Um, and so just a little background about the types of class classes I'm teaching. Um, I joined and my university joined the HHMI sponsored CPHES program um, five years ago. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, this is a, uh, a, a cure-based um, discovery lab course. Uh, it's a two-part lab course, which involves uh, students uh, it, uh, involves it, it, so, so, apologies, it involves students taking soil samples and discovering new phages from bacteria phages from the soil samples. And the second part, characterizing those phages. And the second part of the course, uh, we sequence some of those phages and we annotate the genomes of, of these sequence phages. Okay. Um, and just in case you've never heard of a bacteriophage, I just want to remind you the bacteriophages are viruses that affect bacteria. Uh, and a few sort of fun facts about uh, bacteriophages. Uh, these are considered sort of the most abundant organism on Earth. There's predicted to be about 10 to the 31 bacteriophages on the planet. Um, they're, they're deeply involved in ocean and terrestrial ecology. Um, in, it's predicted that in the oceans, 40% of all marine bacteria are destroyed by phages every day. Uh, so they exert enormous evolutionary pressure on uh, bacteria. Um, my interest in bacteriophages really is that when you start to learn about them, you realize that 50% of almost all the genes in bacteriophages have no known functions. And this is true for even very well studied bacteriophages that probably many of us learned about in university classes like phage lambda. Um, and then there's increasing relevance and interest in, in bacteriophages because the use of bacteriophages um, as, a antibody, as an antimicrobial therapy um, is thought to be now part of a solution to this pandemic of antimicrobial resistance. That's a real issue worldwide. Um, and so this course has been incredibly successful um, at my university and the whole CPHES program. Uh, which I should have mentioned was started by Grant Hathaway at the University of Pittsburgh uh, about almost 20 years ago. Um, in our implementation, we've taught maybe a little over 300 students, all of whom have found these unique bacteriophages. Um, and we've annotated about 38 of these uh, sequence bacteriophages. We've isolated these phages from a variety of different uh, bacterial hosts. Um, and what's, I think, so great about this as an undergraduate course is it really introdu introduces students to authentic discovery research with really clear research objectives and benchmarks that eventually can conclude in the publication of some of um, The pacing of the course allows students to fail and have room to fail and then to take ownership of the projects and sort of to recover from their failures. Um, and it's created, at least in my university, this amazing group of undergraduates who know a, lot, know a lot about phages and are interested in phages. And it's actually had a real impact on my own research program. I, my background is also in, in yeast, yeast genetics. And in the last five years, everything I do in my own lab is now on phages, and not on yeast. Then. Okay. so. In terms of talking about uh, AI, the use of AI, it's specifically in the second part of the course, which is this phage annotation course. And so here I've just shown part of a map of a phage genome. Um, and what the students do in the course is initially the phage genomes are annotated through auto annotation software, um, which does an okay job at annotating the genome, but then students go through and check every start site of every gene to make sure that they were placed correctly. They'll evaluate gaps within, between genes for potentially genes that were missed by some of the auto annotation software. They'll evaluate yeah, if the encoded proteins, uh, transmembrane domains, or if there are tRNAs present. 
And it'll also the key thing they'll do is they'll assign functional annotations to each of the genes. And then finally, uh, this annotated genome will be submitted to GenBank and potentially published to that either as an MRA or as a micro publication. And so the sort of most important part of this process really is to assign these functional annotations. Um, and to do this, uh, we use a variety of different uh, servers like BLAST and HHPRED and other tools to sort of evaluate what's known about the sequences. But with the advent of AlphaBold, um, we realized that we should try to you know, make use of that as a way for students to try to uh, understand you know, if the predicted protein structure can tell them something about the function of the gene, uh, the genome. And so just to highlight why this is such an issue, this is another phage we've worked on, phage bromden. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, about 50% of the genes um, in most phages have known a function. And so here in all in green are all the, all the genes that have known function, and in white are all the genes that have unknown function. Uh, and in bromden, there's also five genes which are considered unique. So these are the only example of these genes that the entire database are found in this one, this one genome. And so it's a real issue. So all of these genes with known one function, we annotate as just an NKM, known one function. Um, it's a real challenge in phage research is to understand what all these other genes do. Um, and in the context of the course, obviously we, we were, the students in doing the annotation are, are both confirming the auto annotation, but they're also trying to do their own new discovery research and see, can they find a new function that hasn't been done previously. Um, and so we decided to try to implement AlphaFold into this process. And so I'll start by just introducing AlphaFold briefly. Um, I assume many of you uh, have heard of AlphaFold and potentially used AlphaFold and might understand it better than I do. Um, but to understand the, the problem behind AlphaFold, you need to just revisit what's known as the protein folding problem. And that's just the question of, can the three-dimensional structure of proteins be predicted by the primary amino acid sequence? Um, and so this is a problem that was posed you know, when the first protein structure was solved, which is here on the left, this is my logo. Um, and there was no solution. And I remember when I was in graduate school, this was you know, the topic of a lot of discussion. Could this ever be solved? Um, and the approach really has just been to solve more and more structures. Those structures are deposited in the protein data bank. And just recently, there are now over 200,000 structures, most of which are determined by X-ray crystallography, but many now by prior EM and SR. Um, and using all this information and AI, uh, DeepMind, which is uh, um, an offshoot of Google, uh, developed this AlphaFold. Um, as a way to predict protein structure. Okay. And so uh, the way in which these protein predictions are tested um, is every two years, I don't know if it's still happening, uh, given the success of the AlphaFold too, but every two years, these people who predict proteins would meet and at the critical assessment of protein structure prediction meeting, um, and they'd be given amino acid sequences and asked to predict the structure. And you can see that over the years, the, uh, the accuracy of the prediction has been quite low. Uh, the uh, the y-axis here is the, um, what is it, the general, I always forget the acronym GDT, but it's the uh, dis, it's a, basically a measure of how close the prediction is to the an actual structure. Um, and anything over 90% is considered uh, nearly you know, as good as a crystal structure. And so you can see over the years, the predictive properties of these uh, prediction programs have been quite poor. Uh, in 2018, Apple Fold was uh, released and did much better than previous versions. And then in 2020, Apple Fold 2 was released, which now gave over 90% uh, accuracy of this metric. And so here on the right are two of the, two of the proteins that were solved by Apple Fold 2, where one was a our link polymerase, another was a Houston tip. And you can see the experimental result compared to the computation prediction were almost identical. Okay, and so after this point, you know, people now use alpha 2 all the time to predict their protein structures. And in some cases, it's really good. In other cases, it's, it's not as good, but it's a really amazing tool um, to do this. 
Um, and this is sort of the uh, sort of the flowchart of how Apple Gold II works. I'm not going to explain this at all, and I, I really couldn't do that. But you input your sequence. Um, there's a search of databases based on sequence level um, and based on what's known about the potential structures um, of, this, of sequences similar to that. Uh, and then through uh, artificial intelligence, and in this case, it's neural networks as opposed to uh, large language models. Eventually, a protein structure is predicted. Um, and there's now a newer version of AlphaFold, this is AlphaFold 3. It's similar, but a little different um, in the way in which it's, it's computing uh, these predictions. But the key thing for use in the classroom is it's much faster, it's more accurate, and it has a much easier interface. Um, and it also allows you to uh, look for the structure of, incorporate DNA, RNA, ions, and ligands within your protein structures. Okay, so just to talk briefly about the past implementation that we used with Alpha 2. We started doing this in 2022 with a small group of students in this annotation class. Uh, and then last year, we had all the students uh, generate one AlphaFold structure from among the genes that they were responsible for annotating, and then a small group of students analyzed additional genes. Um, and doing this, they were able to find sort of interesting hits, inter interesting structural hits, which definitely enriched the annotation experience and made it sort of more of a connection to the proteins that they were working on. Um, and in one case, there was a hit that we think is going to allow us to assign a function in tail assembly, phage tail assembly, to a protein that up until that point had been not a function. So that would be considered like a real research success, I think, to be able to, to do this. Um, and it definitely enriched the discovery component of the course by allowing the students to sort of probe a little deeper into whether or not they could figure out the, the function of the proteins they were looking at. It definitely it reinforced foundational knowledge of protein structure. Um, and it also highlighted the power of AI in biomedical research. And so I thought I could give a quick example of how we use this and how AlphaFold 3 works. Um, and to do that, I just need to briefly go over one aspect of phage biology. So phages exist in two developmental states where either they can lyse the bacteria or they can integrate into the genome lysogen. Um, and many of you might remember from previous classes, or maybe some of you teach this, that this decision between lysogeny and lysis is determined by the out lambda repressor, which is a transcription regulator. Um, and so when we look at lysogeny in other phages, we're curious of wh whether or not a similar system exists. And so this little example involves this group of phages that we found. These are called the AC cluster of phages that affect the Arthur vacuum bacteria. And we've found this type of phage many, many times in sequence of over 19 of them. Um, and this is just a phylogenetic split tree showing the relationship of many of these phages. And one thing we found is that all these phages are able to form lysogens. So we wondered whether or not they contain something that looks like a uh, lambda repressor. And when we look, and these are two, two uh, genomes, crewmate, or parts of two genomes, crewmate and Vizalitsa, these are two phages, we don't find anything that looks like a lambda repressor. So we don't really understand how lysogenes are obtained in these phages. But what we do find is that there's this very conserved serine integrase, which is responsible for inserting the genome into the bacteria. Um, and typically, in the case of lambda repressor and other situations where you have regulation of lysogenate, those genes fall near the integrase. So we explore the region around the integrase. And notice that there are several genes that are present in all of these phages. So, this DNA binding protein, which is G50 in crewmate and 43 in Zalitza, is one of them, as well as this Spartan like radius is present as well. And many of the other genes are different. And so we wondered if these, this DNA binding protein might play a role similar to that repressor. And so this is where we used AlphaFold to look at the structure of G50. This is a student did this, it's Adam Mitchell. And so this is just an example of what the structure would look like. Uh, in the AlphaFold server. Um, and in when you see parts of the protein prediction in dark blue or this lighter blue, that means a certain high confidence. 
Um, and so we can see there's three domains that seem to be applied confidence. And on the right here is what's called a predictive um, alignment error, um, which gives you a measure of how confident the model is for the position and space of each residue in the protein. And so, oh, I'll just, so, so everything that is off axis and is dark green is considered higher confidence. Okay? So you can see here's the two, three different uh, structures. And then these darker green areas that are further off axis represent the sort of interface between these two different domains. Okay, okay Adam, um, I'm just gonna oh, yeah. interrupt. I'm gonna oh, we're almost done. Okay. No, we're done. okay, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. I, can, I can stop here. Um, I can go through the rest of these examples uh, tomorrow. I apologize. Yeah, no, that sounds great. But I'll just finish with by saying that the plan for the implementation next year is to use this alpha point three. We've been using alpha point two before, which will allow us to test multimerization more easily of smaller genes, um, and as well as explore interact protein protein interactions between neighboring genes. And then finally, I'm running this workshop tomorrow where I will circulate uh, through Paul probably a simple protocol for using. AlphaFold3 and FoldSeq. Um, and then I can provide some potential sequences that people could fold, or you could come with your own 